Hello everyone and welcome to a new Let's Play. It has been so long since I've done a Yu-Gi-Oh game. So I figured let's do Duelist of the Roses uh, for the first time ever. I've owned this for I don't know how long and I'm just getting around to playing it. I think there's also a game called like False Bound Kingdom that I've owned for a while. The British Empire in the 1480s. The War of the Roses, a powerful struggle between the houses of Lancaster, the Red Rose, and York, the White Rose, to decide a royal successor. Ooh, the volume is very loud. Right, we're going to lower that for, for the time being. Uh, to decide a royal successor was nearing an end. With the Yorkists... Well in the lead, the reign of Richard III was but a step away. But in France, Yugi, Henry Tudor, the last Lancastrian heir, was being forced to live a life of exile. The Lancastrian forces were rendered powerless by ancient cards of sorcery wielded by Seto and his seven followers who, known as the Rose Crusaders, served under the flag of the Lord Crawford, a powerful Yorkist nobleman. Lacking a duelist to champion their cause, defeat was imminent for the Lancastrians. In England, dual card games were still at the fledgling stage. Thus, the Lancastrians had to look elsewhere for a duel master capable of facing the Rosencruz in battle. With this in mind, Margaret Mai Beaufort of Lancaster secretly requested a high druid to summon a duelist from another age. Oh, we're at, uh, Stonehenge. Oh. <laughs> Summoned from the mystical circle of red and white roses, the one capable of harnessing pure power. There was truth to the legend of the Rose Duelist. Lady Margaret, I, I did it. Now we have the means for defeating the evil forces of Rosencruz. Oh, my apologies. In my excitement, I'd forgotten I was in the presence of the Rose Duelist. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Simon McMorman, the High Druid and Servant of Lancaster. May I be so bold as to ask the name by which the Rose Duelist would like to be known? Uh, alright. R. Y. A. M. Ryan, a fine name indeed. Now, here's the situation. The year is 1485, and you are currently in Stonehenge, near Salisbury, England. The British Empire is in turmoil, with the House of Lancaster's rightful claim to the throne being challenged by the Yorkish usurpers. The power struggle is referred to as the War of the Roses, a name based on the badges used by both sides. A red rose for the Lancastrians and a white rose for the Yorkists. Right now, our kingdom is threatened by the Yorkists and their wrongful claim to the throne. All because the Yorkists enjoy the support of the Rose Crusaders and their sorcerous White Rose cards. Using our Red, ro our red Rose cards, we summoned you, Ryan, to this day and age. We hope that your dueling experience would defeat the Rose Crusaders and lead us to victory. You will help us? Of course you will. Foolish of me to even doubt where your loyalties lie. Rumor has it the only that only the legendary Rose Duelist stands a chance against the power of Rosencruz. We appreciate any help you can provide against them. Before I forget, I should warn you that the rules to dueling differ here than those of your age. Ooh, I'm gonna need a tutorial. Uh, here in England, dueling is governed by what is known as the perfect rule. In addition to several minor distinctions, there are two major differences. One is the existence of movement or positioning. The other is the deck leader concept. Okay, so movement and positioning would make me think it's more of a tactical thing, similar to Capsule Monster. Deck leader, I have no idea. These are two aspects of dueling that were lost in the process when the ancient sport of duel monsters 
was adapted to card form. The Perfect Rule represents these lost rules that were miraculously revived here in England. Perhaps a practice duel will serve better than an explanation, shall we? Uh, yes, play a practice duel, please. Let's start with the basics of dueling. First, let me show you how to summon a monster. To bring a monster into play, you must summon it from your hand to the field. Now, let's draw a card from your deck. The Dark Magician. Currently, the card you're indicating is your deck leader, the Dark Magician. Let's order your deck leader to operate your hand. You can do this by selecting your deck leader and pressing the square button. See the blue square? That's the area where you can place your summoned monster. Okay. Let's place the monster in a position directly in front of your card leader. Line up the cursor by pressing the up directional button and then the X button. This is your current hand. Apparently there's only one monster in your hand that can be summoned to the field. That is because summoning a monster requires a certain amount of power. So we have four stars of power we can do. The spot currently indicated is where your current... Hold on. The spot currently indicated is where your currently available summoning power is displayed. Okay, so the star power. Got it. At the start of the duel, you have four summoning power. This amount will increase by three every turn, and you can acclimate up to 12 points. When a monster is placed on the field, summoning power points equal to the monster's levels are expended. Your current summoning power is four. Hence, the only monster card you can summon on the field is a level four monster, the Celtic Guardian. The dark cards are monsters that you are unable to summon this turn. Let's summon the Celtic Guardian. Move the cursor over. Press the X button. At this point, if you wish to cancel your selection, you can press circle. To enter your, your selection, press the X button again. Okay. Now summon the Celtic Guardian, the card is ready for battle. Now let's attack your opponent with the Celtic Guardian. To control a monster on the field, you must first activate the card you wish to move. The Blue Eyes White Dragon is your opponent's leader. Let's try and attack the enemy leader. First, let's activate your monster by lining the cursor over the desired card and pressing X. See the yellow square? This indicates the space where your monster can be moved this turn. Your opponent's card leader is directly ahead. Let's just move straight ahead. Uh, select your destination with the cursor in the X button. Okay, so we do that and we just start moving forward. Completing its move for the turn. Monsters can only move once per turn. However, deck leader summoning does not count as a move. Hence, the monster can move immediately after being summoned. Ooh, that's, that's actually really nice. Since there is nothing else to do this turn, let's end your turn. To end your turn, press the start button. Okay. From this point, it's your opponent's turn. Your opponent is summoning a monster preparing to attack you. Oh, he moved up his thing. Now it's your turn. There isn't any monster heading your way. Let's use the Celtic Guardian to eliminate the threat. To attack your opponent's monster, all you have to do is move your monster into the same space occupied. Monster attacking another is referred to as a battle. The outcome of the battle is decided by the attack and defense, similar to regular dual monsters. Putting the outcome aside, let's attack. Remember how to move your monster? All right. You've eliminated your opponent's monster and moved one space closer to your opponent. However, your opponent is now aware of your monster's strength and will probably bring a more powerful monster into play to retaliate. Let's take a look at the factors that govern the outcome of a battle. See how your attack played out. Your Celtic Guardian was in attack position. Monster automatically assumes the attack position whenever it's moved. 
The attack position indicates that your monster has either moved or attacked. A monster that doesn't move and holds its position is said to be in defense position. Celtic Guardian and Opposing Baby Dragon are both in attack position. Okay. Outcome of the battle is decided by the attack position stuff. So, this is stuff that I know uh, from just playing Yu-Gi-Oh! back when I was a kid. Higher attack means you beat it. Damage is dealt to the life points. Uh, yep, 200 life points. Look what happens if the opposing monster was stronger. We would try and attack a Komori dragon. We would take the damage. We would lose our monster. Yep. Uh, if they're equal, they're both destroyed. Yep. Okay. That stays the same. Uh, defense position. So if we attack... Yeah, the hard armor has less defense than we have attack, so we just destroy their monster, but no damage is dealt. Okay, so every everything so far is similar to regular Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, Aqua Mador, so our monster won't be destroyed, but we'll take 600. Yep. And then if it's the same... Um, I don't remember the if it's the same. I think it's uh, still destroyed. No, they bounce off each other. Okay. As you call your the guardian successfully, successfully moved into a, a position where it could attack your opponent leader. Your opponent's leader is unsupported and defenseless, leaving it direct open for a direct attack. A direct attack is an ideal opportunity to inflict major damage to your opponent. Attacking a leader will result in inflicting life point damage equivalent to the monster's attack. Let's try a direct attack. The procedure is the same as just attacking a monster. Okay. Yeah, that works. It is important to avoid direct attacks as much as possible. You should act immediately whenever an enemy monster is approaching your leader. Currently, you're winning. However... Your opponent may retaliate. With this in mind, summon a monster with high defense points. Let's use this monster to protect the front of your leader. Since it has high defense, place it in defense position. Uh, to set a monster in a defense position, follow the same as steps as movement and set the cursor in front of you. Press the L and R1 buttons to toggle between attack and defense. Ah, okay. Be careful that you don't move the monster to its destination space, as it will automatically set the monster in attack. Okay. Note that a monster card summoned on the field initially in face, placed face down and is hidden from your opponent's view. Card will be flipped up whenever it attacks or is attacked by the enemy. You may also manually flip up stuff. If you do, select L2, R2 to flip it face up. Okay. Once you have the card in the desired position, press the X button. However, you should note that a face-up card cannot be returned to the face-down position. That's why you should be very careful when you manually turn a card face-up. Okay. Your opponent has summoned a powerful Kaiser Dragon, a powerful Dragon-type monster. You don't have a monster that's strong enough to withstand an attack from this. Fortunately, you have a magic card... On the when, when did we get a magic card on the field that's capable of stopping the attack of dragon type monsters? Well, that's supposed to be a trap card, but okay. Uh, in fact, the magic card is capable of preventing the movement of all dragon type monsters on the field. Let's use the magic card magic to stop the opposition and focus on continuing our attack against the opponent's leader. You can trigger a magic card by flipping it face up and completing its move. Flip the card face up in a manner described earlier. The code control inputs are the same for magic as they are for monster. Okay. That dragon capture jar. 
Spellbound. The opposing monster has been neutralized with the magic. Now let's go further into the enemy leader. Okay. A duel can go either way. At times, you may find yourself cornered by a cunning opponent. There will be occasions where there's nothing you can do except defeat, but accept defeat and go for a rematch. You may surrender by pressing the select button. But don't give up too quickly. Well played card could easily turn the tide of battle in your favor. Okay, so... Everything seems normal compared to, like, how I played Yu-Gi-Oh! as a kid. Let's take a look at how a duel is settled. There are four individual conditions for deciding the outcome of a duel. One condition is reduce life points to zero. Yep. Easy peasy. Your Celtic Guardian is about to execute a direct attack on your opponent's leader. Since your opponent only has a life point total of a thousand, we would win. All right. So that makes sense. In this scenario, both life points are at 500. Your opponent has a not-too-powerful Needle Ball. However, the monster has a special ability. When this monster is eliminated in battle, it automatically inflicts 500 points of damage to an opponent's life points. Strength-wise, the Celtic Guardian is far stronger than Needle Ball. Now let's take a look at what happens when you attack the monster. And that will result in a draw. Yep. In this matter, the outcome of the duel is decided after all the triggered effects have taken into account. Be careful you don't get dragged into a draw when you have a good chance of winning a match. Okay. Another condition that decides the outcome is occupation of summon areas. The areas indicate in blue where you attempt to mon summon a monster are summon areas. If all of these areas are occupied by opponent's forces, you lose the match in play. To be more specific, if your opponent occupies all your summon areas at the end of your turn, you lose. If you find yourself surrounded, it is vital that you clear at least one of these areas before your turn is over. Makes sense, because you wouldn't be able to um, uh, summon anything. If your leader is in this position, that leaves you with only three summon areas. When you're at an edge like this, there are only a few summon areas. If they are still, if they are occupied, you lose. Yeah, so you kind of want to be not at the edge, but you kind of want to be uh, not in the middle either. Depending on the terrain conditions, there are spaces that can't be used as summon areas. In this situation, there are fewer summon areas, and if they are occupied, you lose. Okay. Next condition is deciding the outcome of a duel in life point comparison resulting from the clock running out. The time remaining in the duel is played in this location. The number of turns remain will decrease by one following the completion of your turn and that of your opponents. When the number of turns remaining reaches zero and both players complete their respective turns, the outcome of the duel will be decided. The player with the higher life points is declared the winner. Hence, maintaining a lead is a key strategy for a smart duelist. Okay. I don't know if that's similar to how, like, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! does it. If, um... If, you know, by the end of, like, the round, the higher life point wins. Because I know, I know for Magic, uh, they don't care what your life total is. If you don't finish by time around, it's a draw. Uh, the final condition uh, is unleashing Exodia the Forbidden One. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know all about Exodia the Forbidden One. Yep. Exodia is the leader. Summon the limbs uh, in the surrounding areas. Flip over to attack. When you enter into your turn without any spells or controls preventing you from executing a normal turn, 
Exodia will be freed, and your opponents will face defeat at the hands of this awesome creature. Does this, this concludes our lesson on victory conditions. Okay. Oh my goodness, the tutorial is longer than I thought. Let's take a closer look at some of the other details and rules for dueling. First, you should be aware that there is a limited limit to the number of cards that can be placed on the field. Here is a situation in which several monsters have been summoned to the field. This display shows how many monsters you have on the field at this moment. Each duelist can only place five monsters. Okay, that's similar. Any attempt to summon a monster that exceeds the aforementioned limit. Oh, it just doesn't happen. Will result in the summon monster being reduced to dust. Likewise, only five spell cards. Okay, similar to regular Yu-Gi-Oh. You should take care of to leave a summon area open so you won't find yourself in a situation where you are unable to play a key card. Talk about the consumption and recovery of summoning power points. Summon power, uh, require a monster. Each list has four. I feel like we have already gone over this portion. Yep, so now we're down to zero. Three points will be added on our turn. Points that are not expended will continue to accumulate. So we could pass the turn a couple times to get up to 12. However, you will not be able to accumulate over 12. Even in situations where the additions of points would exceed 12, you will not gain beyond that point amount. Yep. Some monster spell cards can significantly help or hinder recovery of summoning power points. Use these to your best advantage. Okay. When placed face down and unused, your opponent will not be able to tell whether you have played a spell or monster. Like monster cards, spell cards can be attacked and can initiate attacks. The face-up monster card is yours. Your opponent has a spell card. When the spell card is attacked by a monster, it is easily destroyed. Although the spell card is easily destroyed, attacking a spell card will never result in damage to your opponent's life points. Okay. Now you have a face-down monster card. The, in monster versus monster battles, face-down monsters are turned face-up. Here's what happens with spell cards. We just overtake it. Okay. The spell cards cannot be used to discover the identity of monster cards. The only way to do that is to attack with a monster card. Let's see what happens when a spell card is used to initiate an attack. Do we lose? We don't lose life points. Similar to when it was attacked, the spell card is easily destroyed. This is still the case even if the monster card is in defense position. Spell card is destroyed. When you use a spell card to initiate an attack against an opponent's face down monster card, although it can't be veri verified, the card being attacked is a face down monster card. Previous case with the monster card being attacked, the monster card remains face down. You should always remember that although ma spell cards are capable of powerful magic, they can be easily destroyed. Yeah, move it carefully, keep it away from others so that we can, um, you know, use them. When your spell card attacks an opponent's spell cards. First, let's see what happens when you attack a spell card with an opponent's face down. Yeah, so we have a face down, we attack the spell card, we overtake. 
Spell card cannot turn an opposing spell card face up in battle. Okay. But if we're face up, do we win? We do. It is important to remember the conditions for activating a magic card. A magic card is activated when it completes its move face up. However, regardless of whether a battle occurs, the magic card is activated since it completed its move face up. You should be careful about moving a face up spell card. Okay. Oh my god. Terrain effects. The field of which uh, battle is conducted consists of space for various terrain. A majority of these terrains feature have their own unique energy force and often strengthens or weakens a monster. So this is similar to field spells in Magic. Or not in Magic, in Yu-Gi-Oh. Celtic Guardian is on a space that has no terrain effect. Okay. Yep, they will remain the same. Let's move it into the meadow. We got a 500 boost. Nice. Since the Celtic Guardian is a warrior type monster, it has an advantage when occupying meadow terrain. In this manner, whenever a monster is in the favored terrain, uh... 500 bonus points are awarded. Ooh. Another added bonus is when a monster is in its favored terrain, it's increased movement. Ooh. If a monster starts its move in a favorable terrain, the monster can move up to two spaces. A monster card with increased movement capabilities is noted in this area. When the monster with this mark is toggled for in movement mode, Oh, we can go diagonal now. Ooh. So we can go further, but... Oh, no, we would still be in the thing. Please note that a face-down card is not awarded terrain bonus. Okay. Yeah. You, you just went through that. There's no movement bonus. But we turn it face up. And bada-bing, bada-boom. Okay. I think that was similar to Capsule Monsters as well. Dark Terrain Space. Uh, that's a Fairy-type monster. Which is not suited for Dark Terrain. Uh, the attack and defense uh, will be reduced if we move into there, huh? Yeah, minus 500. But I assume we can still move. Let's talk about terrain with special features. First of all, there's the Labyrinth Terrain. Extremely powerful obstruction and cannot be entered by most monster and spell cards, nor by a leader card. A Labyrinth Space cannot function as a summoning area. A card that has entered the Labyrinth Space by means of effects such as teleportation can easily exit the space and enter adjacent spaces. You can also initiate an attack against a monster located in the Labyrinth Space. Wall Shadow has the ability to freely enter and exit the Labyrinth Space. It is currently located in the Labyrinth Space. Flame Swordsman has an attack capability that exceeds Firewall or Wall Shadow. What happens when the Flame Swordsman attacks the monster located in the Labyrinth Space? Oh, we can. We win, but we do not move. Okay. Aside from certain monsters, Labyrinth is a space that can never be entered, making the space ideal for preventing advancement. Crushed terrain can be entered with no resistance and has no positive or negative effects on most monsters. This area is infected with a plague that will attack and destroy powerful monsters. Any monster with an attack of 1500 or more will, imme will be immediately destroyed under any one of the following conditions. Summoned into a crushed zone, moves in a crushed zone. Located in a space that is transformed into a crushed zone, or is in a crushed space when either you or your opponent's turn ends. Yeah, that's the that's the crush card virus as an idea. Uh Celtic Guardian can enter, but Flame Swordsman cannot. Well, Flame Swordsman can, but we end our turn and Flame Swordsman dies. 
There's no restrictions to exiting the crush space and entering an adjacent space. In short, if you find a monster has moved into a crush space by means of tel such as teleportation, you can avoid destruction by immediately moving out of the space. Crush space is activated by the attack level. A leader, which doesn't have an attack or a spell, can move normally into the space. Okay. There's so much tutorial. We are 32 minutes in, and we're still in tutorial. <laughs> Mark of a good duelist is how well he or she can use terrain to the advantage. Okay. Condition by which a card is unusable, unable to move as a result of spell or other means. When a card is spell bound, it cannot be moved, flipped, or repositioned for attack or defense. Spell bound, I'm assuming the one means for like one turn. Turn count for the spell binding, spell binding begins on the turn following the actual casting of the spell. So if a card is spell bound for one turn, it won't be able to move in the next turn and regains movement the following turn. Gotcha. Okay, so now we're no longer spell bound. Uh, there is a very dangerous condition, condition, eternal spell binding, which doesn't release... The bound card, no matter how many turns may pass. Yep, infinite symbol. Okay. Very difficult to break an internal spell binding. There are only a few monsters and spells that have the capability of free, uh, freeing from that. Aside from the aforementioned, the only other way to free a monster from a spell binding is to destroy it. Let's take a look at the most common form of spell binding, the attribute binding. Parrot Dragon is a wind attribute monster with an attack of 2,000 and much stronger than the Celtic Guardian. However, the Celtic Guardian is an earth attribute monster, which places it in a more favorable position against wind. Oh god, there's going to be tight matchups. Okay. Their advantages and disadvantages of attributes are displayed respectively during a battle. When the Celtic Guardian attacks... We lose 600, but we spellbind. Is that worth it, though? We could count the Guardian destroyed, but however, the Parrot Dragon is spellbound. Monster with lower attribute that survives a battle is spellbound in the turn that follows. This rule also applies even if both monsters survive the battle, as it's a case where a monster is unable to destroy an opposing monster with a higher defense factor. Attribute differences can be effective when a weak monster to rent to render a strong monster immobile. An opponent's powerful monster is in pursuit. Don't you don't have any surprise up your sleeve, and your leader is isolated, creating a dangerous situation. Even under such desperate circumstances, a good duelist will bide for time, believing in the summoning monsters and chance of drawing a card that could turn the tide of battle. Your belief in the luck of the draw could be the key to winning a battle. Among duelists, this belief is referred to as the destiny draw. Depending on how desperate a situation is and how gifted you are as a duelist, you may be granted the opportunity to attempt a destiny draw. Looks like victory may smile on you. This is your chance to draw that card that could turn the tables against your enemy. Destiny draw opportunity is signified by the flashing the area that is normally used to indicate that you can summon a monster in your hand. Drawing when this condition is indicated will usually result in the drawing of a card that will help you in your current predicament. Try drawing a card now. Take a look at the last card that you drew on the far right. It should be a card that will bail you out of the current situation. Use this card that will help you overcome a desperate situation. However, you should remember that a destiny draw depends on luck and only occurs once in a duel. When it might happen is anyone's guess, all you can hope for is that Lady Luck smiles on you when you need it the most. And that won't happen if your hand already consists of five cards. Uh, 
If that is the case, all you need to do is reduce your hand in the following turn in hopes that it triggers a destiny draw. Of course, if your deck is low on cards, there will be no destiny draw. Luck is an important element to victory. Even the best duelist could lose without the aid of Lady Luck. All cards are deeply bound to the duelist. Your experience is a vital key to the strengthening your deck. An indication is provided by rank, a record of a card's performance throughout all your duels. Highly ranked card will demonstrate the special powers unique to its nature when the card becomes a leader. Take a look at Dark Magician ranked Field Marshal. At this rank, the card's special powers are extend support range, increase strength for same type friendlies, and weaken specific enemy type. Take a look at the opponent's leader. Oh my goodness. Baby Dragon has the following increased movement and open opponent's cards. Huh. So there are various special powers that evolve for each leader monster. We won't be able to cover them all. To understand the concept, let's take a look at Baby Dragon. This is the best way to learn about special powers of a card is to raise your own leader and watch it evolve through the course of battle. Baby Dragon has the power to turn any approaching enemy monster card face up for open viewing. Your Celtic Guardian is currently face down and near the enemy monster. Move the card towards the enemy. Your Celtic Guardian is automatically turned face up, revealing its identity to your opponent. The effect will also flip a face down spell card to the face up position. This is just a simple sample of one of the special powers that a leader has. To find out more, you will simply have to raise your own leader and watch the cards evolve as you duel. Is that the end of the tutorial? That was a 40 minute tutorial. <laughs> All right. This is going to be part zero. I'm going to release part one on the same day. So you're going to see this. Then you're going to be able to actually see, you know, hopefully actual gameplay uh, come about. So thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And I'll see you uh, in a couple of minutes for part one.